Great, thank you, Andy, and welcome, everybody. So we'll just take you through the, the slides and maybe Andy could uh, switch to the next slide. So um, yes, this is the results for the first half of our financial year ending 31st of March, 2021. So during that six month period, we've um, further increased our assets under management to a record 30 billion pounds. The increase has partly been fueled by very strong, in fact, record inflows of 6.8 billion pounds. We've completed the final arrangements for the PAX World Management Acquisition, which closed in early 2018, but it's had an earnout period. And we've got a great foundation and platform for, for further growth. So on the next slide, you can see the, the financial highlights. So alongside um, strong growth in assets under management, we've been able to increase revenues quite significantly. And alongside increased revenues, although costs have increased, they've done so at a slower rate. And therefore, the, the profit metrics and earnings per share metrics have increased quite substantially as well, as has shareholders' equity. And at the bottom right of the slide, you can see that we have announced a doubling of the interim dividend compared to the same time last year to 3.6 pence per share. On the next slide, the, um, the background to the business, as many of you will know, impacts is a a investment management firm which is dedicated to one particular investment philosophy that is that the transition to what we call a more sustainable economy uh, will lead to very strong investment performance for certain companies and that's what uh, we are determined to uh, to exploit through smart portfolio management so we're doing that in a commercial fashion and uh, at the same time of course able to appeal to clients and asset owners who are interested in where their money is deployed. And so our non-financial reporting around, for example, environmental impact metrics is a, a key part of our offering. So today we are um, nearly 200 staff. We've been recruiting quite substantially of those 200 staff, over 60 are investment professionals. And we have uh, now six offices around the world, London, Dublin, Hong Kong, and three offices in the United States. On the, um, the next slide, you can see the, the market context. So the transition to a more sustainable economy is really producing some very exciting developments all over the world. The transition to clean energy and um, smart ways of, of uh, transportation, zero emissions vehicles based on electric propulsion or even fuel cells uh, growing very rapidly. Water treatment, water supply, smart materials, new ways of providing food around the planet and lots of interesting developments in fintech and healthcare in certain of our portfolios. The drivers of these markets are of course a combination of technology change and new business models, but also policy. So smart regulations, climate change being a particular issue, uh, which is leading policymakers to ramp up the new sustainable markets. And at the same time, asset owners around the world are increasingly minded to look, cl look closely at where their money is being allocated. They are wanting to see detailed reports from their asset managers as to what stocks they own and are very keen that good governance practices are um, pre prevalent throughout investment portfolios. So we are looking very closely at governance in the context of sort of broader ESG analysis. Investment opportunities, as I mentioned, continue to grow. So over the period we've seen with the Biden administration's infrastructure plans, further indication that the US will invest in um, infrastructure development. And that's alongside the new China five-year plan, which has got a strong focus on sustainable development. So that's uh, very supportive to our, um, our overall investment thesis. The <clears throat> trends amongst asset owners are, have been accelerating. We've seen very strong engagement by asset owners in the oil and gas sector in the last six months, and as well as putting pressure on boards to um, diversify and look at climate change strategies. There's also been lots of encouragement for oil and gas companies to go to uh, so-called corporate net zero, and that has already led to quite significant investments in the renewable energy sector, which is benefiting our, our markets. So in that context, as Impacts now has more than 20 years of experience of managing money in these markets and a scalable business model based on extending our our asset center management in a small number of attractively positioned investment strategies that are producing excess returns for clients um, with staff, which is well motivated, aligned with shareholders through its 21% ownership of the business, then we do feel we've got an excellent platform for, for further growth. On the next slide, 
the um, the growth of business over this period has been very broadly based. So in the UK, we launched a second mandate with St. James's Place. And alongside that, we've been able to extend the scale of our Irish usage platform, which we sell particularly in the UK, but also around continental Europe to over one and a half billion pounds. Around the rest of Europe, we have had uh, quite significant new wins, particularly in Scandinavia. In the Asia Pacific region, we announced a new distribution partnership with Fidante Partners, part of the Challenger Insurance Company, and picked up several new mandates, particularly in uh, Japan with uh, Nomura, um, and in, in Australia as well with, um, with CBUS, one of the superannuation funds. And then in North America, we've extended the scale and outreach for our Paxwell funds platform through a number of very powerful intermediaries. And with our global opportunity strategy, picked up quite significant new mandates, not just in the US, but also in Canada. On the next few slides, you can see some um, fairly dry investment performance numbers. I think the key message from this slide is that our environmental market strategies, which um, are over three quarters of our asset center management, have been performing very, very strongly, not just over recent periods, but also going, going back to five years and actually longer. So against the All Country World Index from MSCI, then the excess returns here are very attractive to shareholders um, and bode well for further expansion. And then on the next slide, the um, so-called sustainability lens st strategies that we run in a number of areas have been um, continuing to advance. So our well-placed global opportunities strategy, which takes a broader view of sustainable development than just environment, has some excellent medium to long-term um, performance numbers. In recent months, it's actually been slightly behind the world index because it has a growth bias and up until March anyway value stocks were, were more in favor. We have seen that uh, that lag reverse to a, uh, an excess return more recently than the, the end of March. We've also seen um, continuation of good performance in the US with our US large cap fund um, and our, our bond funds um, as well. So um, good foundation, not just in environmental markets, but also across a broader range of capabilities uh, using our sustainability lens. The breakdown of the AUM increase over the period is shown in this chart, and there's a comparison with the second half of the previous financial year. So um, crucially here, in inflows exceeded outflows um, in the context of positive market moves. And after the end of the period, during the month of April, we extended our 30 billion pounds of AUM up to 32.2. So we had a very strong April with that increase being almost equally split between net inflows and um, market growth. This next slide just gives a snapshot of where our, um, our assets are um, invested. So on the top left, you can see the um, the strategies that we run, so AUM broadly based or nicely spread across a wide number of impact strategies. So we are able to tap into the success of um, quite a number of different products, if you like, to, um, to further scale. The bottom left shows the, the nature of our clients. So BNP Paribas Asset Management um, has been our largest distribution partner for quite some time and uh, remains so. But we also have uh, very material asset under management in segregated accounts for clients, Irish usage platform, and also the Pax World funds in the US. And then in the top right, um, you can see that geographically speaking, Europe is still slightly over half in terms of where our clients are, are based with um, the UK um, quite material now and um, North America nicely placed and probably likely to, to grow quite considerably from here. On the next page, um, this is a little bit more detail on the flows that we've received during the period. So this is just the flows rather than the total assets. And on the left, you can see in the UK, St. James's Place uh, was the largest contributor uh, by some margin. And uh, that did include also the picking up of a second mandate from St. James's Place alongside the one we've been running for, for just over four years. In the middle is the suite of five sub funds that we run for BNP Paribas Asset Management. These are all our environmental market strategies, which were growing nicely. And then on the right hand side, you can see the rest of the world, essentially um, North America in the middle, Asia Pacific at the bottom and other countries, particularly 
continental Europe at the top. So notable there was the very strong increase in um, expansion of the Pax Wall funds in the US together with quite a few new North American accounts. On the next slide is the detail around the finalization of the acquisition of Paxwell Management. So this is the business based in New Hampshire that we bought back in January 2018. At that time, we bought the um, significant majority of the business from the family owners, but management retained a 16.7% stake, which we had agreed to purchase at a, a fixed price. And that fixed price has been crystallized now with payment in January this year. So we paid a net $3 million additional uh, on top of what we paid the family for the management stake. We also paid out a very small amount of contingent consideration, which was the, the earnout and the formula for the earnout uh, crystallized just a small amount of, of payment. Um, the Aston management, which was at the heart of the, the formula, continue to rise beyond the end of the measurement period and um, is well in excess of the, uh, the, the target for the, um, for the minimum payment for the earnouts. So I think we uh, had a bit of fortune, good fortune with regard to timing there. The, uh, the payment was, was quite low relative to what it would have been had it been struck three months later. Anyway, very pleased to confirm that the acquisition has gone very, very much according to plan no staff departures, no client losses, significant additional growth, not just of this business, but also the rest of our North American footprint and um, excellent prospects for the future. Over on the next slide, a quick summary of our work in making sure that we've got the right talent at the firm. Obviously, this is a, a people-led business and recruiting the right people is absolutely essential. We've increased headcount during the period by 10%, but um, in addition to that, we've, we've got approximately another um, nearly 10%, I think, of uh, offers um, or, or of staff um, uh, increase to, um, for, in people who should be joining over the next few months. So by the end of our financial year, we would expect to have recruited somewhere between 35 and 40 people over the, the course of the, of the financial year. We have been strengthening our uh, systems around career development. Um, we've just done a staff engagement survey, which had an excellent response rate and an 88% engagement score, which is shorthand for saying that uh, the vast majority of staff are extremely uh, happy with working at impacts and staff morale is, is very high. So in the context of a business which has doubled in size in 12 months, then we're very pleased and um, proud of our HR team for having put um, in place the systems to, to make that happen. And of course, um, the, the managers around the firm for having led the business over that time period. We've also made big leap forward in Dublin, which has been chosen as our base for European Union activity. And uh, we now have uh, seven staff in, in Dublin, expectation that will grow slowly from here, but um, that's well-placed now to act as the European Union marketing hub and also the route for some client management work. Systems and infrastructure continue to be uh, at the heart of a successful delivery of service to clients. So we integrated our global trading desk back in um, January and we've also been investing incrementally in new IT systems, for example, a new customer relationship management system. Over on the next slide, the, the future for the business, of course, relies on continued strong investment management performance of what we're running at the moment. The capacity headroom of the strategies we're running at the moment remains quite considerable in aggregate. And we do believe we can, roughly speaking, double our business in terms of AUM to around $80 billion without the need for major contributions from new, um, as yet unlaunched strategies. So um, as we build our business organically, then we'll be further investing in investment quality, investment process quality and staff, but crucially also in distribution and client service. We do have ambitions, however, to launch new products in time. We seeded our Asian opportunity strategy at the start of the year, and that will be building its track record and um, over time will be, will be shown to clients. And uh, there are other ideas in the hopper, but um, nothing that's gonna be uh, ready for launch um, over the, the near term. And then finally, in private markets, we're continuing to 
run a successful investment program in our renewable energy infrastructure investment work for our third new energy fund and uh, confident of being able to attract more capital to raise in the sector in due course. So at that point, I'm going to hand over to Charlie to, to run you through the financials. Great. Good afternoon, everybody. So, yes, I'm delighted to take you through these financial results, which really show strongly the scalability of the impacts business model. So, um, first, you're looking at revenue. All of the comparisons I'm going to be drawing are actually relative to the second half of last year. The reason being that impacts doesn't really have a, a calendar seasonality to it. So, the most recent period is the most uh, relevant comparison. And you can see here on the first slide that revenue is up 31%, um, which we are very pleased with. And that is uh, driven primarily by the net flows into the, the funds that Ian's just been talking about. That's mostly a, a current period effect, but there's also a little bit in there relating to um, the annualization of flows that, that occurred in the second half of last year, where we're now obviously earning a full six months worth of income. That, um, that concept of money that comes in during the period only contributing to some extent for the period means that there's further annualization uh, embedded in these numbers. So the 60 million you can see here, if we calculate um, the run rate at the end of March, which put simply is just the March revenue times 12, then you can see that the run rate is now looking at more like 139 million. So it's a significant increase. Uh, you can also see on here on the right is the, the good diversification of the client mix, which is consistent with uh, Ian's slide from earlier on. And in terms of our pricing to our clients, the, uh, the weighted average margin by the different types of business is very stable. The small um, ups and downs you see are simply a factor of the mix of which particular funds and accounts uh, have pr primarily sold over the period and doesn't relate to any um, sort of discounting effects or anything like that. So basically the, the, the fee we're charging is stable um, you know, versus the prior period. Moving on to the, the next slide, which is looking at the uh, operating costs and operating results. We can see on the left, the, the three main drivers of cost. So that's non-staff costs first, which have edged up slightly. Um, there's no big driver within this. Clearly there's still no travel. So we would expect some travel to return once the restrictions lift. Um, and the effects are things like professional fees, um, some pairways that we pay to distribution partners and such, such items. The main item, of course, for a people firm such as Impacts is, is the people cost, the middle uh, bar being the fixed staff costs, salaries and, uh, and benefits, etc. That's gone up as we've hired staff over the period and uh, are likely to continue to do so, as Ian's mentioned. The final column relates to final bar, the light blue, is our variable remuneration, which is determined formulaically. It's simply 45% of the operating profit pre the bonus. And as the profit has gone up, then the, the bonus pool has gone up by the same amount. So that is, that's the operating costs. Uh, when you combine the revenue and operating costs, you get the operating profit. So you can see, see here the 20.7 number is 62% up on the, the second half of last year. I compare that to the, the revenue slide, which was up 31% and is at the heart of my, my message around the, the, the scalability of the, of the model. On the right, the operating margin of 34% shows this in, uh, in more graphically. And at the bottom, I note the, uh, operate, the, the run rate operating margin, which again is simply March times, times 12, is 35.6. The slight Caution around that number is that we do have a number of open hiring positions, as Ian mentioned. So were those people to have been in place at the end of March, that number would have been closer to probably something in the 34 to 35% range. But nonetheless, very strong progression from um, the, the last couple of periods. If we move on, then focusing again on this scalability point, we can see here quite what's going on at the people level. Uh, and on the left, top left, headcount has increased by something like 10% over the period. Uh, and, and also bottom left, the average cost per employee has dipped. The reason for that is that whilst, um, in spite of a little bit of wage inflation for the uh, staff that we're here already, the highs that we've made in the period have typically been at the mid and junior levels. Um, on the right, we see the investment team. So that's edged up, but at a slower rate than the rest of the staff, meaning that we've got a very efficient and repeatable business and are able to manage larger and larger amounts of money with basically the same team, which is graphically shown on the bottom right, where the amount of assets under management per investment staff member is now nearly half a billion per person, 
which is up forty uh, percent on the end of the second half. So that really, in a nutshell, shows the scalability of the business. If we move on to what that means for for shareholders, then the earnings are clearly up period on period, reflecting that rise in operating results after tax. There's one number on here which I'll talk to, which is the foreign exchange loss of 1.2 pence per share that doesn't feature within the operating profits. It's a bit of a misnomer. We are required to calculate this amount, but it relates to the intercompany structure that we have. And there's an exactly offsetting amount uh, within the, uh, the equity section of the balance sheet, i.e. this is not an economic loss. So that if it were not for that accounting treatment, that 11.8 pence number would be um, bigger by the same amount. What this means for the dividend is that, as Ian mentioned, we have doubled the interim from last year, reflecting the, the broadly doubling of operating profit compared to the same period. And at 3.6 pence, this is three times covered by earnings and positions as well for a, a strong full year dividend once we get to that point at the end of the year. Moving on now to the balance sheet. Uh, the balance sheet of impacts is very straightforward. It's basically cash, working capital, and then intangible assets relating to the acquisition we did a few years ago, the most interesting of which is the, is the cash. So um, having mentioned earlier that the business isn't seasonal from a calendar perspective, the balance sheet is seasonal. And the reason for that is that at the end of September, we have a cash balance that typically then reduces over the next six months as we pay bonuses and we pay the final dividend. So you can see here that um, the cash has still been strongly positive over this period in spite of paying, um, making the, the bonus payment from last year. Um, once we've paid the dividend, the only other item on here of particular interest is the seeding of investments. This is something we need to do as part of our ongoing product development. And in the period we seeded one um, new strategy to create capacity for future periods. So that was 2 million of cash. And the resulting 35 million of cash is um, entirely adequate to run the business. On the right, we give an illustration of how we look at that. Um, firstly, earmarking an element of that cash as a, as a risk buffer, which we're required to do from a, a regulatory perspective, and then earmarking it further for the near-term cash flows that we're aware of, in this case, the interim dividend. So the, the 10 million is really our war chest or buffer to do other things such as further seed investments or business development, et cetera. Final financial slide looks at the shareholder register. Um, not too much to highlight here, other than note we did issue 2 million shares in respect of staff equity awards. These staff equity awards um, come out, the cost of these comes out of the, the bonus pool I described earlier, that, that 45%. So um, there's no, um, uh, so it's, it's expensed. For the most part, the staff awards we've made to date have been covered by purchases in the market where we've gone out and purchased shares in an employee benefit trust to mitigate the effects of, uh, of the staff awards. However, we are free to do what's, in our view, the best for shareholders' interests to either issue shares, which we issued 2 million in this period, um, or buyback shares. To date, it's typically been, been mostly buybacks. This diagram shows that were we to um, fully mitigate the effects of awards issued to date, we would need to either buy back or issue another 1.9 million to get to a stand uh, a balanced position. Very final point is the uh, current ownership model where we have the 21% employee ownership, 14% owned by our major distribution partner BNP and a 65% free float. That's me on. So just wrapping up on the Outlook slide, the business is, we believe, very well positioned for further success. So in the context of very supportive market environment, very strong drivers towards the transition um, towards a more sustainable economy, then impacts is scalable business model based on a small number of carefully chosen, well-performing investment strategies, uh, coupled with a very well-diversified international distribution structure does give us great uh, scope for further expansion. We have plenty of capacity left across the board. Our team has been working together for a long period of time. We've got a very stable team with great alignment with shareholders and um, around the world. I think we're seen as an authentic voice in this area. One of the very few managers at any scale dedicated to this transition to a more sustainable economy. So the scaling of the business has, of course, produced rising operating margin, rising dividends, 
and um, assuming that markets remain uh, neutral to broadly positive, we'd expect um, trends to, to continue over the medium to long term, at which point I'll hand back to Andy. Great, thank you very much, gentlemen. Very impressive numbers, very you know, comprehensive presentation as well. Um, right, a number of questions, so we'll get straight into them. And uh, there are one or two links um, around America. Uh, could you comment a little bit more about the pipeline for acquiring AUM in the US and, and is that accelerating? And looking slightly further down the road, you know, when do you see the, the US getting up to a, a similar profile and a similar rate of growth as to the European operation? So in the US, we're doing two things. We are, in terms of distribution, we're promoting our investment strategies to institutional clients, either directly or through consultant um, connections. And that's been underway now since 2012. And then secondly, through intermediaries, we're promoting the, the similar strategy group, but typically through um, the Paxwell Funds mutual fund range. So uh, in both distribution channels, we are adding headcounts, um, adding more, more systems. And um, based on recent experience, we would expect both channels to, to grow. We're seeing very good client um, interest in, in both areas. So making good progress. Having said that, though, the broadly defined sort of European area is continuing to, to grow even at a possibly slightly higher rate. So um, it's hard to, to be sure now how those dynamics are going to play out. I think we can be confident about growth in both areas, whether the North America will really accelerate now relative to Europe is a hard one to call. Having said that, I think with the new Biden administration, a lot more spending in the clean economy and, and therefore many more positive outlook statements from US corporates around their own domestic uh, market potential, then I think um, there should be um, a, a real sort of acceleration of demand from US investors for exposure to the space. So um, yeah, lots to look forward to there. We're continuing to, to add headcount. And then a question again on the pipeline, but perhaps more on a, a global basis. Do you notice any significant difference uh, in the institutions or the scale of their uh, potential interests if you look at the pipeline now compared to 12 months ago? Um, yes, 12 months ago is obviously a bit of a difficult comparison because um, May, June 2020 was sort of right in the, the heat of, of the COVID um, pandemic. But if we say comparison to say 18 months ago before the, the pandemic, if that's a fair interpretation of the of the question. Um, yes, yeah, so I look, look, I think um, what, what we're seeing now, and particularly with the new China five year plan with the Biden administration in place with the end of COVID um, in certain parts of the world, potentially in sight, touch wood, um, then economic sentiment generally remains very, very buoyant. The uh, Keynesian intervention in the economy by central banks and by, by governments more broadly is leading to um, uh, asset price inflation and uh, more fiscal spending, if you like. And, and that generally is, is good for, for our sector. And at the same time, we have the have increasing concerns about climate change. We've got the COP26 conference at the end of the year. We've got uh, very strong pressure on oil companies to do something other than, than um, explore for, for oil. And, and all these factors um, reinforce the, the, the acceleration of interest by asset owners, and I would certainly say that's much stronger than, say, 18 months ago. Okay, and, and perhaps continuing from uh, that, and your, the firm's stance on, on, on climate change, and, and particularly someone asked about TCFD, uh, how would you categorise your, your plans uh, going ahead um, for uh, accelerating change at, uh, at the corporate level? Well, we're doing several things in this area. What we're best known for is investing in in environmental solutions. So backing those businesses that are helping to mitigate climate change or helping companies to adapt to climate change effects. So that's that's sort of area number one. Second is looking very closely at climate risk. So we've been working with the companies we've we invest in for nearly a decade now to help them think through climate risk and encouraging them to disclose it. Um, and then the third thing is actually working with the wider community and regulators to 
really illustrate the importance of strong regulation around climate change mitigation in particular, and uh, I think in time adaptation as well, so that we can um, map the transition to a low carbon or zero carbon economy over the next um, 20 to 30 years in a, uh, a structured way that creates incentives and, and sort of long-term frameworks for companies to, to plan uh, their investment programs against. So yeah, this is very much at the forefront of, uh, of impacts this activity. Okay, there's a couple of questions uh, about your competitive positioning, which uh, obviously looking at uh, growth and these numbers is, is very strong at the moment. Um, as you mentioned, there's enormous interest in ESG and uh, a remarkable amount of funds rebranding their titles with that, uh, those three letters in the title. Uh, there's also um, growth in, in passive management. Um, do you regard uh, these as significant threats um, or are you comfortable that your long experience and track record is, uh, uh, is positioning you well to, to win further mandates? I suppose a related question comes into pricing pressure, um, whether uh, there, there is attrition because of the amount of competition or whether your strong record actually allows impacts to charge some level of premium pricing. Well, on the first point, we are pitching our services really at the sophisticated institutional and intermediary end of the market. Um, and therefore, we're able to really point at the, the thoughtfulness of our work around market analysis, stock analysis, portfolio uh, construction, et cetera, and really demonstrate that the, um, the analysis of risk that we do is fully um, taking on board ESG type factors and the work we do around market growth and corporate strategy is, is holistic and um, taking account of, of the uh, sustainability factors that, as some may, may term them. So I think when our sophisticated clients do their, the due diligence that they invariably do, they find that what, what Impacts does is, is very well considered, uh, deep analysis backed by and delivered by a very capable team and we've been doing it in a consistent fashion for a couple of decades. Uh, there are very few of our competitors who can tick all those boxes, if you like. Um, so yes, the, the kind of badging or, or superficial labeling that, that may be going on in some corners that might suit certain, um, certain channels, for example, sort of direct to retail is not an area that we need to compete in. In terms of pricing, then we've always aimed to charge a, a sort of fair, a fair price. We, rarely charge performance fees. And um, we are uh, really just looking to, to, to be in the middle of the road when it comes to, to our annual management charges. That has generally meant that we have not seen much in the way of, of competitive pressure, pricing pressure on the existing accounts that we run. When it comes to new accounts, the, the competitive dynamics are different in different parts of the world. So certain parts of continental Europe is very stiff competition and and um, lower fees relative to say parts of North America where we're typically seeing um, higher fees. Great, thank you. Um, perhaps one for you here, uh, Charlie, um, in terms of the you know, excellent operational gearing and, and the most small increase uh, in staff, numbers, staff costs to, uh, to cope with expanded uh, assets under management. Um, during the presentation, you mentioned uh, that they're relatively junior um, uh, employees being sought at the moment. Could you um, outline where that might be geographically, if you have specific areas where you're, you're keen to uh, expand? And uh, there is a question, have you, have you lost anybody who you would regard as a significant staff member in, in, in recent months because of the competition for talent? Um, I think I actually said mid and junior levels. Um, mm -hmm. in fact. So in terms of the, the growth in headcounts, it, it is certainly you know, continuing. And as I mentioned, there's, there's probably 40-ish you know, headcount in the current year we, we anticipate. And what's great to see is that, you know, perhaps no surprise, we are able to find very strong talent. We are an attractive place to work. And when we go looking for talent, um, we are able to find you know, very good people. And it's uh, in spite of that, all the COVID restrictions, touch wood, it's been a great experience in terms of finding and on, onboarding those, those new colleagues. Um, there's been basically no, no losses at all um, in terms of uh, people that we um, 
you know, we particularly feel disruption were that to be the case. Um, we've not lost people from the investment teams. We just, we just, we just don't. I mean, over, over the years, we've lost a couple, but nothing in recent years, and certainly nothing um, over the past past twelve months. Um, so I think we feel um, we're not complacent on that. It's something that really matters. All the ma things that Ian said before around the importance of our HR processes, our culture, and um, treating staff properly. Um, the ability to award um, bonuses and equity is a component. It's only one component, but it is important, and we're able able to do that. And um, it's, a, it's a theme that we are constantly focusing on the, the importance of retaining staff. Um, you know, as we go forward, the, the, uh, I would expect it still to be primarily mid and junior levels. There'll be the occasional more experienced person. The rate of growth is such that um, it is important to make sure we do have the right bench strength and um, diversity of skills. So I'm not ruling out the occasional hire, but in terms of the, the bigger numbers overall, it would very much be skewed to the junior levels. In terms of location, um, we've got a, a rough idea that it'll it will roughly follow where the existing headcount is proportion wise. The beauty of the model we have is it is very much integrated. Um, now the acquisition is behind us. That was three years ago, and so when we're now planning our resourcing, we look at it in terms of the team first, and then we will, which might be operations or it might be an investment team, depending on what it is, and uh, the team first and location second. So I, I can't particularly. It's, I don't think it's a very interesting way of looking at it because it's not how we look at how we run the business now. Um, but I would say it is fairly broadly spread around the teams, but particularly focused on the client service side and then those parts of the operational framework. So that's the middle office, uh, performance and reporting, IT, compliance. These are volume sensitive. And so we'll tend to um, follow, largely speaking, the, the number, of, um, number of people in these other teams. Great, thank you. Um, Asia uh, is a relatively small part of your AUM at the moment. Uh, do you see that as a particularly uh, attractive opportunity at the moment? And if so, uh, what are your plans to access it more? Well, we've had research out of Hong Kong since 2007, and we've had Asian clients since uh, 2009, I think. So uh, very much a long-term commitment to the whole Asia-Pacific region. We have continued to build our research team. So we launched our Asian environment strategy back in 2009. And as I mentioned, we've launched a Asian version of global opportunities uh, very recently. So really see the um, uh, locally Asian research group growing. The approach to clients and distribution in the region has always been through third parties. So we've had a very successful relationship in Japan with BNP Paribas, who've helped us uh, secure Nomura as a key client. And um, as I mentioned, we've, we've just um, signed up with Fidante as a distribution partner for Australia and actually New Zealand as well. We do a little bit of um, direct promotion to, to family offices, foundations and endowments, and it could well be that we'll, we'll grow that. So prospects for the future, well, I think the Asia Pacific region is is highly attractive. The environmental problems there are acute in many, in many um, dimensions. And so local populations are really um, putting pressure now on regulators to, to get involved. Corporates are responding. And so there's a uh, growing number of investment opportunities and um, a much more sensitized set of, of investors. So yes, um, really planning to, to expand there. It's a long way away from, from headquarters, so we're being quite careful about planning that. But um, I think we would anticipate um, further announcements in due course, and we're certainly open to, to further partnerships um, for, for distribution. Okay, right, just a couple more to, to deal with. Uh, going back to uh, TCFD, uh, same question as I said, he was just curious in Impax's own plans in the next one to two years on, on disclosure, if, if you would like to add to that. Yes, so the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, or TCFD, is a, a, um, a, a new-ish trend in disclosure. It's likely that regulators will, will pick up on the recommendations of the TCFD Task Force, which reported in 2017, and will be expecting that corporates will disclose their activity around particularly climate change, risk management, um, potentially also around um, mitigation of emissions. So we have announced that we will um, aim to be um, net zero or net negative in terms of emissions. 
corporately across our uh, PL and balance sheet, which we have been for, for many years, given our investments from our own balance sheet in, um, in new um, wind, solar, and hydro power stations, uh, offsetting our, our um, emissions. And um, we're certainly committed to maintaining the sort of industry leading standards of disclosure around TCFD frameworks as they emerge. There's at the moment, as I'm sure the questioner knows, a, a sort of absence of, of um, standardization in this area. So one needs to be a little bit careful not to, to rush out with something that uh, may not become the, the standard in, in due course. Yeah. And then the last one about um, technology and uh, much as there is, as you say, an absence of standardization in uh, defining impact. Uh, historically, there's been challenges in, in measuring impact uh, in sustainable uh, situations. Um, how do you assess the, the use of scientists, um, engineers uh, for uh, assessing technical sustainability of a, a company? Um, and is it something that um, impacts uh, or, the, or those skill sets, uh, do you draw on them? Um, and if so, could you give uh, the audience some examples of where technology has improved, enabling you to find uh, the, the right sort of businesses to invest in? Well, I think the starting point is the definition of what we call environmental markets. So we designed one of the world's first green or environmental classification systems or green taxonomies back in 1999 and that's formed the basis of the FTSE Russell green revenues classification and um, data and index series which is now um, growing very very nicely so we have a very robust definition of what constitutes an environmental market um, companies solving environmental problems or improving the efficiency with which resources are are used the work that goes into understanding those boundary definitional boundaries and interpreting which uh, markets and companies are eligible does involve quite a lot of technical input so we support FTSE Russell on a semi-annual basis in the context of the committee that that um, opines on changes to their classification so that's a starting point the second point of course is to just understand corporate strategy with regard to um, how companies are growing their businesses in these different markets. So we employ a dozen or so scientists and engineers in our investment teams who are doing investment work, not just pure science work. And that's a crucial part of our um, value add, if you like, just getting under the skin of, of these topics and making informed decisions about opportunity and risk. And then there's the, if you like, the impact measurement angle, which I think you referred to, which really is the continuation of six years of work that we've been doing with our investee companies to gather from them data around the um, environmental impact that they're having, which is typically positive around water conservation or materials um, substitution and recycling or um, CO2 um, reduction through um, displacement or avoidance. So we have, over those six years, used our internal technical expertise to work with not just the companies producing the data, but also our assurance partner and who's verifying our methodology in this area. And that has really allowed us to, um, to leverage the science expertise within the companies we're investing. Um, so has led to kind of science and technology based um, process or, or formula for impact measurement. We've been one of the first investment managers in this area. But I think to summarize, um, science and technology engineering um, skills are crucial to really getting under the skin of what's going on in these, in these markets. And so um, if we're not employing um, all the talent ourselves, then we, we are definitely uh, leveraging it either through um, specialist advisory groups or um, when we talk to, to companies, so getting advice and input from, from their specialists as well. Great. Well, thank you very much to uh, our audience for your attention and some very good questions. Ian, Charlie, very good of you, as always, to, to make the time to talk to uh, an interested investor base. And we wish everybody a very pleasant long weekend. Thank you. Thank you.